Greetings to all. It's another time to be together, and I thank you for inviting me into your places, uh, however you're watching or listening, probably listening to this message. I hope it uh, blesses you and, uh, and that you have a fantastic rest of your week. So I just wanted to start by asking you to imagine, to take some time and imagine. Imagine you wake up tomorrow morning in a very different world. A world so different, so strange, so foreign to all that you have known and experienced in all your life. Imagine. Gone are all the services, supports, and resources that you have at your disposal today. All of it gone. Gone access to medical service. Gone financial support and security. Gone first responders, gone police, gone any guarantees of employment, gone opportunities for advancement, gone all the choices that you currently have today, all gone. And imagine the recently widowed woman across the tracks living in a shack, elderly and poor, no children, no family, no husband, no money, no support, nothing, all alone. Imagine you wake up tomorrow in a very different world. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for this time. And as we return to Paul's letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy, we ask, Lord, that you would help us to really grasp chapter 5. This is what we're looking at today, Lord, and help us understand the implications uh, that is for us as individuals and as a church in the world. Thank you, Lord, for your presence in our lives. And I pray for those who are listening uh, today. I pray, God, you would meet them at their needs and uh, that they would know you uh, as their Lord and Savior. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So please turn in your Bibles uh, to 1 Timothy chapter 5. And we'll be looking at the first 16 verses. Uh, we are finally in chapter 5 in our sermon series. And basically it should be done in two weeks. So 1 to 16 today. And then we'll look at the rest of it the following week. So I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. Uh, the Bible I normally use uh, for, for reading and preaching is a New International Version. But I think the New Living Translation really helps us. Uh, understand um, in our own kind of language what's going on in these 16 verses of chapter 5. So chapter 5, verse 1. Never speak harshly to an older man, but appeal to him respectfully as you would to your own father. Uh, talk to younger men as, a younger man as you would your own brothers. Treat older women as you would your mother, and treat younger women with all purity as you would your own sisters. Take care of any widow who has no one else to care for her, but if she has children or grandchildren, their first responsibility is to show godliness at home and repay their parents by taking care of them. This is something that pleases God. Now a true widow, a woman who's truly alone in this world, has placed her hope in God. She prays night and day, asking God for help. But the widow who lives only for pleasure is spiritually dead, even while she lives. Give these instructions to the church so that no one will be open to criticism. But those who don't care for their relatives, especially those in their own household, has denied the true faith. Such people are worse than unbelievers. Verse 9. A widow who is put on the list for support must be a woman who is at least 60 years old and was faithful to her husband. She must be well respected by everyone because of the good she has done. Has she brought up her children well? Has she been kind to strangers and served others, other believers humbly? Has she helped those who are in trouble? Has she always been ready to do good? The younger widow should not be on the list because their physical desires will overpower their devotion to Christ and they'll want to remarry. Then they would be guilty of breaking their previous pledge. And if they are on a list, they will learn to be lazy and will spend their time gossiping from house to house, meddling in other people's business and talking about things they shouldn't. So advise these younger widows to marry again, 
have children, and take care of their own homes. Then the enemy will not be able to say anything against them. Verse 15, For I am afraid that some of them have already gone astray and now follow Satan. Final verse 16, If a woman who is a believer has relatives who are widows, she must take care of them and not put the responsibility on the church. Then the church can care for the widows who are truly alone. The Lord bless the reading of his word. So as we begin our study today, we apply three important rules. Context, context, context. We will also need uh, to put on our first century hats from time to time and then put back on our heads our 21st century hats along the way. But there's more. We must remember that we all come to this text or any part of the Bible with our own life experiences, whatever they may be, presuppositions, understanding, biases, and ideas. And we need to really acknowledge this every time we read and study the Word of God. And here's my point. Before us, before us are the inspired words of God. We let the words of God wash over our hearts and minds as we are led by the Holy Spirit. But we don't shut down our minds. We engage them as we think biblically through this text. We don't shut down our hearts. See, we engage this text with all we are. And this takes effort on our part. It takes determination. It's really important. So now as we look at chapter 5, and we can just add chapter 6 to it, the Apostle Paul here now turns his attention from instructing Timothy and the church how to deal with the false teachers and all that has occurred because of that to the actual ministry of a pastor, elder in the church. And by extension, the church as a whole. All, uh, this is really has to do with the family of God, the family taking care of the family. Now, Sam Rainier, who is a pastor of West Bradenton Baptist Church, said concerning ageism, and if you don't know what ageism, you can look it up if you will. Um, it's just uh, discrimination against a certain age group. And it doesn't matter what age group, but age discrimination against that. And, but it's more defined if you look it up. He said this, when considering ageism, the church may be one of the worst offenders among organizations in our culture. And to be fair to Pastor Rayner, his comments were addressing how many churches while giving mental assent to the idea, or at least the principle, of respecting of your elders, in reality, when hiring, are clear they want someone young. Now, Pastor Rainier, in his assessment of ministry, is only revealing a truth in the West, particularly in the West, in covering a persistent attitude that the West has regarding a defined and specific age group that, for our purposes, we will define as baby boomers and older. Our purpose today is not to make our text fit this train of thought, but to recognize that each of us in the West has this bias in our understanding and the experiences regarding the stages of life. Now we need to put on our first century hat and consider the first century view on the different stages of life. It was already mentioned, I'm sure, last week that elders in the first century were highly respected and sought after for their wisdom and insight and leadership in the church and even in the culture. First century families, my friends, were multi-generational, not unlike the Asian and African cultures as they're located geographically in the world today of the 21st century. The first century church was multi-generational. In their worship, it was a multi-generational worship. Ministry was also multi-generational. Every stage of life was represented and included. Ministry today in the West, more often than not, separates the various age groups, even when they gather for worship. Now, friends, this would be foreign to the first century church. We need to keep this in mind as we begin with verse 1 as we look at it through at this particular text. Now, verse 1 that we read together, hopefully, you read that with me, is really the foundation of how the body of Christ ministers to each other, how the body of Christ cares for each other. 
And Paul here is exhorting the younger Timothy how to minister to the various age groups in the Ephesian church. Timothy was to treat older men as a father, uh, to younger men as his brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters. And Paul adds a caution to the younger women of the church wisely to treat them as sisters with absolute purity. Now Paul doesn't draw this out of thin air. We go to his letter to Romans, to the Roman church, Romans chapter 12, and there he encourages his readers to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, for this is your true and proper worship. And it's from this attitude and posture, my friends, of worship to God, that the believer then serves humbly the body of Christ. And Paul would say more in this particular chapter of Romans, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. And this attitude and posture of worship should lead believers to put love into action. See, love is more than an idea. It's more than a feeling. In the church and in the family, it is put into action. And Paul would say this about uh, the members of a church. Be devoted to one another in love. Imagine. Honor one, above, uh, one another above yourselves. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to show, associate with people of a low position. Do not be conceited. Well, friends, in order to live a life that is holy and pleasing to God, which is our true and proper worship as a living sacrifice, our attitude and posture as believers is one of self-sacrifice to God and others. And this is the foundation. Now, as we look at what's going on here in the first century in the rest of these verses in chapter 5, and I, I would ask you to remember the widow, the recently widowed and elderly lady from across the tracks that we were introduced a moment ago, poor and all alone. Well, friends, verse 3 to 10 speaks directly to her situation. Paul said here in verse 3, read it with me, give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. So what did Paul mean by proper recognition? Well, there's another question we have to ask before we can even answer or attempt this question. We need to ask this question. What does God think of widows, such as Paul mentioned here in this text, who are really in need? What did God think of those? Those widows. Well, in order to find out, we have to go back a bit. We have to go back even further than the first century. We have to go back to at least the time of the Exodus and to the book of Exodus. We know through that book, a wonderful book, I'm reading through it now, read through it yourself, God through Moses rescued the people of Israel from bondage in Egypt. And it was at Mount Sinai that we see that God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, which we will find in the 20th chapter of Exodus. And chapter 21 and following, you will find that these Ten Commandments that God puts there in the 20th chapter worked out in the everyday social and religious life of Israel. It was not just some book. It was action. And chapter 22, if you were to look at it, speaks directly to the social responsibility of Israel before God. The social responsibility of Israel before God. And in verse 22, we hear this. Do not take advantage, this is God speaking, through the inspired scripture, do not take advantage of the widow or fatherless. Fatherless, If you do and they cry out to me, I will certainly hear their cry. And how will God respond to that? Let's listen to what else he said. My anger will be aroused. How serious is this to God? I will kill you with the sword. Your wives will become widows and your children fatherless. And that is something else, isn't it? Wow. It's certainly not what we would think of as God in many circles today. 
and even probably back then. But let's, there's more to this than meets the eye. We need to look at Deuteronomy chapter 10 that provides a commentary that helps us understand God's view concerning widows and the fatherless that he mentions in Exodus. And there we read in Deuteronomy chapter 10, Israel, what does the Lord your God ask you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Do you remember what Jesus said is the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength. That's the first and greatest commandment Jesus said. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And it go, we go on in, um, in Deuteronomy, we see that God is the one who defends the cause of the fatherless and the widows. And also he loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. And this is God reminding Israel that they were in captivity in Egypt. And they were foreigners in captivity. Now, did you notice that this list that we have started here has just gotten longer than God really has his ear open to? The widows, the fatherless, and the aliens. But, you know, friends, there's more. King David, um, he penned Psalm 68 and, and writes this and said this about God. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. So the list just got longer. We have widows, we have fatherless, we have aliens, we have the lonely. Are you starting to see a theme with God here? Let's get back to the first century. Let's go to the letter of, that James wrote in the New Testament. What did he say? He said, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this to look after orphans and widows in their distress. So now we have orphans in there too. Let's go to the Gospel of Matthew. And in that Gospel, among a number of things that Jesus talks about, there's some very interesting things in there, and some, some of that is rather difficult to understand out of its own context. Uh, you know, you don't pull it out of there. But he's, he talks about his return, his second coming. And Jesus said, all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people from one another as a shepherd, shepherd separates his sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Now, we don't have time to expand as we should, but you know, really suffice it that God, uh, Jesus is talking about the judgment day. Then he went on to talk more about the sheep and the goats. And Jesus spoke of a king, who is Jesus, in the end, who said to those on his right, the sheep, come, you who are blessed by my father. And he says this about them. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And they responded with an interesting question. When? When did we do these things? And Jesus said, Whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then the king turned his attention to those on his left, the goats, and said to them, Depart from me, you who are cursed. And then he went on to say this about them. When I was hungry, thirsty, a stranger, needed clothes, was sick and in prison, you didn't help me. Then the goats asked the same thing the sheep did. When were you hungry and thirsty, a stranger needed clothes, were sick, and in prison? And Jesus said, whatever you did not do for the, for the one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Well, friends, now that we have what we understand, what God feels about widows and the marginalized and those in need, the, the orphans, the fatherless, and all those people that are marginalized in our culture and in that day as well, we can answer our initial question. What does Paul mean by proper recognition in verse 3? Simple answer, folks. The same thing that God means. You see, God always cares for those on the margins. He hears their cries. 
And you know what? He, he, he created two institutions to care for these people, these on the margins, the widows, etc. He created the family and the church. Now, in Timothy's context, we can see there was a need, and we're talking about widows here. And it's quite, you know, detailed here in these verses of that issue. And no doubt because of the disorder and the controversies and the confusion in the church, most likely those who were on the margins were put to the wayside or maybe even forgotten, such as the widows, as I mentioned. And as you read through the text, this meant that those who were really in need, the widow who was left all alone, you know that lady across the tracks that was all alone, put her hope in God, day and night, prayed and asked God for help, these widows should be supported financially by the church. And Paul instructed Timothy to create a list, to register them, if you will, of all the widows, it says in verse 9, over the age of 60. And if you consider the context of these passages, and read verse 9 and 10 together, it's most likely that these widows over 60 in the Ephesian church who filled the qualifications listed in these two verses were treated no different than the elders of chapter 3. You see, what happened here is this was now their ministry to the local church and the community around them, but particularly to the local church. They have a home now. They have a family now, the church, because it's... The first family is all gone. The family God created to care for the elderly, to care for their own. Now these widows have a family, and it's called the church. I like what one commentator said about this. Specifically in this context, he said, quote, service to Christ and others is not reserved for the young. Interesting concept, eh? Yet Paul also has some other things to say about widows, if you read on in, in these verses. He said, if a widow had children and grandchildren, that's verse 4, they should care for their own family because this pleases God. Interesting. If you care for your own family, it pleases God. And of course it would please God. Can I remind you of the fifth commandment? Do you remember the fifth commandment? Let me read it for you. Honor your father and mother so they may live long, live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Paul comments uh, on this and says it in a different way, but means the same thing in his letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 12, I mean 1 and 2. Ch children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother so they may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. So there we have this whole thing going back to God's uh, view and intent when it comes to the people in the margins. And then we just have to press pause for a, a minute and think about what Paul said here. Is, and you probably might be saying, well, Paul, you're so black and, and white. And sometimes Paul can come across that way. Yes, it is, friends, sometimes hard to honor our parents. Sometimes the family is very broken so disrupted, so injured, so hurtful, that the last thing wants to do, one wants to do is honor someone. Yes, friends, there are many broken homes, broken and damaged in family relationships. Sometimes it's easier said than done, right? But we can't forget the church. And if you think about now, as we put on our 21st century Western hats, I don't mean cowboys and cowboy hats, have we become so ingrained with the Western mentality of individualism and pull up our own bootstraps idea, tough it out and hope the government will save us, that the church which God created for the broken, the busted, the marginalized, the sinful, the poor, and alone, by the way, we're all sinners and alone, did not God say that he would be the father to the fatherless, that he would be, the, he would be for the orphan, the lonely, the stranger, the alien, the sick, the prisoner, that he opposes those who ignore, toss aside the widows, the orphans, etc. That he opposes the self-righteous, religious, all dressed up with nowhere to go people. And when we think of the family, Paul put it this way. 
Paul put it this way. He said, anyone who does not provide for their relatives, and especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than the unbeliever. And how about the churches that do likewise? How about those churches? I'll let you use your imagination, what God thinks of that. Well, now we're moving into the last verse, few verses, 11 to 16, and we really spent most of our time to date on these first 10 verses. So we, we will be brief as we want to bring this to a close. We see here that when Paul, that Paul instructed Timothy concerning young widows that he, that he was very specific. He said, do not put them on the list. Do not register these widows to receive financial, report, financial support. And he gives them a lot of reasons here in the text. You can read that for yourself. But this is very practical on Paul's part because younger widow, widows most likely get married again. And if they committed previously to serving God and remaining a widow, but then decided to get married, Paul said they would be guilty of breaking the previous pledge. Now, the idea there is, you know, you're making a promise to God and you're being financially supported by the church. Remember, in the context of this first century, you, you need to be like the elders in ministry. And it talks about some of them there in the text here that the some who would be under this sort of idea of being financially taken care of, they might become lazy. And he says other things there. Thereby breaking their pledge to God, to serve God and his people. So he gives some very practical advice to the younger widows. I advise the younger widows to marry again. And Paul is always keeping in mind when he says this in, in the context of the church, because he wants to defend the Christ, the Christ church. And by marrying, the younger widows would deny the enemy, that is Satan, to say anything against them, to bring, bring an accusation against them. And obviously, when you read verse 15, you can see that Paul already alludes to that some have already gone astray and now follow Satan. Remember, uh, this is something that's possible to happen. And then he exhorts, the very last thing is verse, if a woman is a believer and has relatives which are widows, she must take care of them. Why? So the church can care for the widows who are truly alone. So that brings us to the close, but now we ask one final question in summary. How does this apply to me today? How does this apply to me today? Well, let's deal with this in the way we dealt with it in the whole message. Let's deal with the family first. Each family according to the scripture, is responsible for providing for its own needy. Each family is. And you might ask why, because the answer, God said so. You know, we run after all sorts of other ways to get help. But if it's all possible, the family should take care of their own needy. Understanding is sometimes that's not possible. But that's the basic principle there. As we have seen that God is for the needy, God said so, that we're to look after those in our families. Now let's look at the church. Well, the church, friends, is not to give out handouts willy-nilly, if I can say it that way. Because a need alone is not a reason for financial support. The church should give support to the ones who are truly in need. And this talk, this takes discernment and wisdom. Last one we want to throw in there, well, not throw in there to highlight as we close, is let's consider God. See, what we've known, what we learned today, what the Holy Book has told us, or taught us, is the Bible reveals that God's provided the family and the church to guard against abuses, to recognize true need, and to offer godly compassion and support. As you can see in this first century setting, these widows across the track, all alone, with no money, no support, no nothing, with no people, no family, they were given, as God said, a place to have a family. You know, they were no longer lonely. They were in the family of God. And friends, when the family and the church follow God, when God is put first, then and only then can people truly be restored to the dignity and value that God gives to each life. To each life. A family takes care of its own. A family takes care of family. Lord, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for 
the institution. You created the nuclear family. This is something that uh, our world is in desperate need of, and our country too. We thank you for the church, and we thank you, Lord, that there you have provided uh, families and those who are truly alone with a place to have a family and uh, find support in all ways. We thank you, Lord, for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you. Salam.